Welcome to American University's 2021 workshop series sponsored by the Measurement and Evaluation Program. At American University, we are committed to pursuing inclusive excellence. One of our practices shared from our indigenous and native communities is to offer a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our meetings and events. The goal is to build our mindfulness of the historical processes in which we all still participate. American University is founded on the unceded land of the Nakashtank, Anacostian, and Piscataway peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. American University also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples, including those on whose land this institution is located. With this acknowledgement, we commit to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Welcome everyone to, and, uh, Thank you for joining us for our workshop on data-driven decision-making, the elements of data storytelling. Let me introduce our speaker, Daniel Meyer. Dan heads Sonic Analytics and Sonic Virtual Staffing, sister companies that deliver data analytics solutions and virtual staffing to businesses in the United States and the Philippines. Before Dan gets started, we would like to hear where you are joining us from. If you'd like, perhaps write in the chat box and tell us where you are joining us from, and I will read that aloud. We have students in Washington, DC, San Francisco. I will say that Dan and I grew up near San Francisco. <laughs> um, uh, Chicago, Vancouver, British Columbia, Fort Lauderdale, Baltimore, Boston. We have a student joining us from Columbia and Ithaca, New York, um, Virginia, lots of different places in the country and in the world. Thank you very much for, for joining us today. I'm going to head it over to you, Dan. People, uh, the, if you want to put questions in the chat, like you put where you were joining us from today, you can put them there. I can monitor the chat. Um, as appropriate, we will go ahead and, and ask Dan those questions. I don't know if you want to have questions during the presentation or wait till afterwards, whatever you're most comfortable with, Dan. It's fine during. I don't, I don't mind at all. So Okay. So I'll manage the chat and, and jump in, you know, where there's things that uh, that we want to, to get more clarification on. Sounds a few like more people it. from California and someone joining us from Montana. I had to, to get that in there as well. Right. We have students... Uh, evaluation students, we have alums joining us, and then we have a couple of professors that teach the data-driven driven, decision-making course that are joining us tonight as well. So thank you to everyone for joining us. Dan, I'm giving it over to you. Okay, sounds great. So um, thank you so much, Beth, for having me here. It's always a pleasure to be speaking to uh, the faculty and students of American University. I've um, done this a couple times, and each time it's been a really good conversation, so I'll try to uh, keep up that tradition. Um, so a little bit about what I'm going to talk about, data storytelling. It is what it says it is, right? So you use data to tell stories. And it's a really in-demand skill. In fact, if you if you look at, at jobs out there in the corporate world especially, um, it's one of the most in-demand data skills out there. Um, it's also something that I, I know people have become much more appreciative of. Um, the last several years as we've gotten more and more normalized when it comes to uh, understanding the power of data and how it can be used to influence decision making. So I, I'm sure a lot of the stuff that you guys know probably even better than me um, when it comes to some of the technical aspects of, of doing statistical analysis and data science. Um, I'm much more of a practitioner, um, so, but I will share with you my experience having worked with data um, for over 25 years, um, a big chunk of that, uh, working with big companies to help them figure out how to uh, get better analysis, get better results, um, and have better data-driven decision-making. Um, I actually use that term, data-driven data -driven decision-making, um, in one of my companies is kind of like our, um, our motto. So um, anyway, so about uh, what we'll talk about today. So let me move this forward. Oh, I can't move the screen. There we go. 
All right. So I, you know, I always just looked at the um, the website for your program, and two things jumped out at me. I wanted to start with the first is that um, it talks about how students that en enroll in, in your program will have advanced training focusing on building workplace skills, etc. But ethical decision making really jumps out, right? Um, that's the gist of it, right? The idea that we need to be able to um, make decisions that will move an organization forward. So when you're doing evaluation, um, you're preparing people to make decisions based on that data. And then another part that jumped out at me was where it talks about evaluating statements of work and um, monitoring plans performance, but basically design and evaluation. So when I see those two keywords or groups of words, I think this is data storytelling. So um, even though it may not be a formal course, it's deeply ingrained in what you're already doing. And that's awesome because like I said, it's an in-demand skill. Having been um, in corporate America and having worked with a lot of multinational corporations over the last several years, um, there's not enough people that know how to take data and do something with it. There's a lot of people that can report data. There's a lot of people that need the data, but that inter intermediary, the person who can help people figure out what to do with the data is where data storytelling really comes in handy. So um, that's where I kind of want to focus on tonight is this area of using data to help uh, decision makers make decisions. So um, a little bit more about myself, um, just to give you some background. So um, I worked for Wells Fargo um, Bank for about 15 years. That's where I started my career. And I uh, um, got a lot of experience in working with big data projects and doing a lot of things that um, nowadays we call data storytelling. And back then it, the term hadn't been invented yet, but um, we were doing it and we used it to, to drive the bank to be quite successful. Um, I was working for Wells Fargo for, like I said, 15 years. And after about 15 years, I kind of hit a plateau where I wanted to try something new. And I had an opportunity to uh, go overseas to the Philippines and do some training for a call center that Wells Fargo had set up um, in the Philippines to handle 24 seven customer service. And in the call center, they had a bunch of analysts who were analyzing the call center data and they needed someone trained on our systems to be able to do reporting. So long story short, I got to the Philippines and I never wanted to come back. Um, I quit my job at Wells Fargo. I moved across the ocean, set up a business. And the reason I did that is I saw an opportunity to be able to help people learn how to use analytics, how to use data. Um, there are uh, millions of Filipinos who work in call centers in the Philippines. If you call 1-800-whatever customer service for any company here in the United States, you've got a 50-50 chance of probably getting a Filipino virtual or a Filipino call center agent. And so I saw an opportunity. So that's what I did. I moved it across the ocean and I set up a business and I started doing training. And I've trained over uh, 10,000 people on how to use data, how to do business analytics, how to do data analysis, how to do you know, predictive analytics, how to start using dashboarding and business intelligence tools, um, data visualization, and ultimately data storytelling. And so over those years that I've been in the Philippines, about 10 years, I've been able to uh, see a lot of people putting data to work and seeing a lot of people struggle putting data to work. So I really focus a lot of my talks and what I do um, both in academia as well as in the corporate world is try to get people to think more about how to use data in the decision-making process. So that's why I'm here today. Hopefully some of my experience um, will help you get a sense of what uh, can be done with data storytelling. I'll break it down. And then I'll also talk about some different um, techniques, some different methodologies that are used in data storytelling that um, Bev had highlighted that would be good topics for conversation as well. So um, if there's no questions, I'll move on um, to the next section. All good? All good, nothing yet. All right, so um, we're gonna talk about data storytelling, talk about things like param parametric and non-parametric equations, descriptive and statistics. These kind of things cause nosebleed in 99% of people, um, which is why I think it's important we talk about them because this stuff is like, it's not easy for people to understand if you don't understand it. So if you're into stats and it's part of your program, throughout your program, you have to understand different types of statistical analysis, um, you get it. But most people that you're going to be working with don't, right? The reason you get hired to do what you do is you have to be the one to do this stuff. But the people that are going to use the, the results of your um, discoveries probably aren't going to care what these things are. Um, but we'll talk about them. 
as important elements as tools in the tool belt of somebody who's employing data storytelling. So we'll also talk about how to make sense of data, talk about how to, to analyze the data, and then most importantly, how to take that data and do data storytelling. For me, there's three goals in data storytelling. You're trying to enable somebody with the data, you're trying to empower someone with the data, or you're trying to influence someone's decision-making. So we'll talk about those three things towards the end. So that's kind of like the overview for the next probably 20 minutes to a half an hour. Okay, so what is data storytelling? Well, I think first of all, we should start and think about what is storytelling? Storytelling basically is how we share information from when we're born to when we die, we tell stories every day and we're influenced by storytelling. So I think about what are great stories? Like what are my favorite stories? So there's two that come to mind. When someone asks me, what is my favorite movie and what is my favorite book? I always have the same answer. And I'd ask you the same thing. What is your favorite story? In fact, if you wanna drop in the comment, what's your favorite novel? Anybody, feel free to, to throw a couple out there. Um, my favorite novel um, is Charles Dickens, uh, Tale of Two Cities. And I love how it starts, right? That opening line just sets it up. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, right? So I majored in history, not data. I'm an IT data guy by accident, not by professional education. And um, I love the fact that when Dickens opened it up, I, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. You know you're gonna get something that's gonna have a lot of drama, a lot of conflict. and I read the book when I was a kid and I've read it several times since and it's just my favorite novel. Um, it's an epic story. So anybody drop any comments about their favorite novels? We don't have anything, oh wait, The Unbearable Lightness of Being. Oh, great novel, yeah. So um, when you think of great novels, it's because they take people on a journey, right? They follow a narrative. They get somebody from the introduction to the you know flashing out the background, so setting up some kind of conflict um, and then having some kind of conclusion or resolution. And so again, when I think of great storytelling, I think of my favorite movie of all time, um, which was Star Wars. So when that text scroll went across that screen, I was eight years old, so you can tell how old I am. Um, uh, but when I saw that, it was like mind blowing, right? And then what followed was the most revolutionary movie that I'd ever seen at that point in my life. And um, it's just a great story. And 40 years later, there's elements of that that are still being told um, throughout uh, like on Disney Plus and at the movies and so forth. So um, what about favorite movies? When you think of a movie that has a great story, what moves you? What movie comes to mind? Whose favorite movie um, is something that they wanna drop into the comment section? We have Benjamin Button, uh, Private Parts, Out of Africa, the Departed, all, all right. very good stories. Anchorman. Pretty much all of them were nominated for Oscars as well, right? So you start seeing a pattern here is, is great stories need to be put together, right? They don't just happen. You have to design them. And the reason why there's like Oscar, you know, nominations go to best screenplay and, you know, is because they have to write the screenplay to make the novel, usually a novel into a, a movie. So I want to think about the same approach to data storytelling, right? If our goal is to take someone through a journey where they are introduced to something, then they're showed or they're, we're demonstrate to them the conflicts, the, the, the risks, the potential pros and cons of whatever it is we're trying to, to do. And then we come towards a, a conclusion or a climax where we want them to actually take the data, take our analysis, and then we're kind of nudging them in a certain direction. It may be a very soft nudge, or it may be a very, very aggressive nudge, but Regardless, we are doing something. We are picking what data to show and we are picking how to show it. So when we do the data storytelling, we are like the screenwriter. We're not the director who's going to ultimately decide what to do with the data, but we are the one that's influencing that director. So hopefully that analogy makes a little bit of sense. That's how I look at data storytelling. So um, in my experience, I put together these elements of data storytelling. And this is like the, the different pieces that you have to think about before you employ data storytelling. Data storytelling is not something that we employ every day. It's we employ it when we need to do something to either enable, empower, or influence. And when we know we have to do one of those things, we think about these elements. These elements were developed, me and a, a friend of mine, who's also a, a data scientist, um, we developed these when we were doing training in the Philippines and we trained 
um, hundreds of companies on these elements. And basically it breaks down like this. You have to know your audience first and foremost, before you ever try to tell a story with your data, you wanna make sure you fully understand who your audience is. So you wanna make sure that you're able to connect with them because movies don't work if the audience doesn't enjoy the movie. And if you try to show a movie that's got a bunch of uh, slow moving table scenes where it's a lot of an old English and it's like a romantic love story, you try to show that movie to a 13 year old boy, not all the time, but most of the time they're gonna get bored and not wanna watch it, right? So you wanna know your audience, right? You wanna figure out who's going to be um, absorbing what you're telling them with your data. You wanna consider time constraints. Data storytelling is something that you wanna figure out how much time do I have to tell a story? How much story should I tell? Um, that's something important because when you use data storytelling as a technique, when you employ it um, within what you're doing with um, measurements and evaluations, you wanna figure out you know, how much time do I have to explain this? Because I'm sure every one of you can relate to the fact that you have so much data, you can never share all of it. You have to cherry pick what you think are the most important ones. And sometimes the data tells you what to do and sometimes you have to interpret it. But regardless, you have to know the time constraints. And once you know your audience and know your time, then you think about how do you start preparing the data, right? This is when you storyboard. This is when you think about how do I, you know, take all this and funnel it down to what I wanna be able to do. One of the best advice um, I've ever got was from a, a manager I had at Wells Fargo when I first started. He told me, you know what, Dan, you always look at all this data and you know all of it. I don't have time to do that. I need you to tell me the three bullet points. That's it, that's all I have time for. I can't look at your reports. I can't understand your graphs and charts. Just tell me the three bullet points. And that's what I need to make a decision. So when he told me that, that really helped me think about how to prepare and structure my data. So that my data, I'm already thinking about how do I take all this information, knowing who my audience is, knowing how much time I have to give them the delivery, what I'm gonna do. So when I structure my data story, I actually storyboard. Right. I actually uh, used to use PowerPoint, now I use Tableau, but I, I storyboard a lot of times when I'm doing data storytelling. So I can kind of see what the visuals will be, put them into a narrative to be able to really help somebody understand like you would a narrative arc in a novel or a movie. So once you structure your story, then you gotta think about what are the insights you wanna deliver? Um, what are the things that people have to have, they have to take away from? And then as you're doing that, you want to think about the right visuals. Visuals are key. Data storytelling um, does not work without good visuals. And with good visuals, I don't necessarily mean pie charts, line graphs, um, typical things we do in Excel or any other type of, of data visualization. Um, the visuals can be all kinds of things, but they have to be used to be able to back up your insights. They have to add value. They can't distract. One of the biggest challenges people have with using data is that they don't know how to visualize it. I'll talk about that a little bit later, the importance of choosing the right visual. Then you have to design for the big takeaway, right? You're writing a, a screenplay. You're writing a novel with hey. your data storytelling. Do you have a question? Is there something? There was nothing on my side. Maybe someone just went off mute for a second. Okay, okay. So designing the big takeaway. At, Star, at the end of Star Wars, you know, the big takeaway is like the rebels have just destroyed the Death Star and boom, at the end of Tales of Cities, it's like um, one of the main characters sacrifices himself. So even though he's in love with, with somebody, he gives himself up to let somebody else be happy. I mean, the big takeaways there are the powerful things. It's like why Jack didn't get on the door and sunk and let Rose live with the end of Titanic, right? What is that big takeaway? That moment people are gonna go, not gonna forget. What are they gonna walk away with? So you wanna think about that when you're doing data storytelling. And then after you do all this, after you do all these steps, that's when you tell the story. One of the mistakes people make with reporting data um, when you're doing analysis or evaluation is that you just wanna get it out there and you don't really think about who's gonna read it and how much time they have to understand it and is it well-structured and will they be able to take away the key insights? Are they gonna be able to walk away knowing what to do with what we just told them? That's all taken care of before you actually deliver the story. It's all the pre-production, it's all the shooting, it's all the rough drafts, it's all the storyboarding that goes into before you produce your data story. And then the last thing you wanna do is you wanna make sure you create more bullet points, right? So usually they, they, they mirror the, the big takeaway, but for me, you always wanna have people walking away knowing one or two things that changed between when they first heard your story to when you, they, you finish your story. 
they're going to go out and do something differently, or they're going to do the exact same thing they wanted to, you just validated it. Whatever it may be, they're going to um, walk away because you've created memorable bullet points. So that's the elements of data storytelling. So I'm going to walk through an example of, in my experience, when I actually use data storytelling um, before I knew what it was, when I was back at Wells Fargo, I think it's a great example of how you have to understand all these elements. And then after that, we'll go on the technical side. We'll talk more about some of the technical things you can do to be able to deliver better stories. So, all right, let's move on to um, this story. So remittances in Florida. A little bit of an overview, just so that we are on the same page. Um, Wells Fargo was one of the top banks in the United States. There's four of the big banks, right? And back in the financial crisis, there were more banks, but several of them failed. And during 2008, one of the banks that failed was Wachovia. I'm not sure if some of you remember Wachovia. They were very popular on the East Coast, especially in the Southeast. Um, Wachovia went bankrupt, had, got bought by Wells Fargo. So when Wells Fargo bought Wachovia, um, it for the first time gave Wells Fargo a footprint in the state of Florida, which was a really big deal. Because up until that point, Wells Fargo had never actually had branches in the state of Florida. Now, the part of the bank I was working for back in 2008, 2009 um, is called Global Remittance Services. And remittances are money transfers. Basically, um, if you're an immigrant to the US and you have a family back home and you're sustaining your family back home by sending them money, it's called a remittance, right? Um, the biggest money transfer operator in the world, everyone knows is Western Union. Um, but beyond that, there are dozens, if not hundreds of other companies and banks and entities that send money overseas um, as part of a remittance package. It's separate than doing a wire. It's cheaper, it's faster. Um, it's designed for person to person money transfers. Again, primarily for immigrants to send money home to their loved ones who they're supporting. Um, that's why they came to the US to work. So anyway, long story short, Wells Fargo had this golden opportunity to be able to now have remittances in its branches in Florida. Why is this a big deal? Because Florida is one of the most diverse states in the country, has an incredibly high percentage of people from uh, Latin America, um, as well as from Asia that live in Florida. And this is a primary market for remittances. When we first found out that we were acquiring Wachovia and we were gonna be able to rebrand the Wachovia branches, um, the first thing my group did was like, okay, so when can we start sending remittances? Um, and so we went through a process where there were a lot of people at a lot of levels trying to figure out how do we um, do this right? How do we launch the remittance service in Florida? And so there was a bunch of high level executives in on it. There was a bunch of people that were you know, talking about data, um, but for the most part, they were still kind of old school. They were relying on a lot of their experience on what to do. And this is an example of how it happened. And this thing still happens more often than not across corporate America and corporations all over the world today is that top level executives really aren't always very data driven. Um, and so you see this kind of thing happen. And this happened back to when I was at Wells Fargo. And the thing is, is that when we decided to launch Express In, the decision was to launch it in Miami, in the southeastern part of Florida. So Miami is incredibly diverse. There are parts of Miami that are like 90 something percent um, Latin American or Caribbean. So it would make sense from that perspective that if we're sending money overseas, and then we have a, a big population of people that send money overseas, we should launch in the biggest city and the biggest market in the state of Florida. So the idea was we're gonna do an express in launch. We've uh, identified a branch in Miami. Um, we're going to have a really big you know, press release. We're gonna do a ribbon cutting on the rebranded the re Wells Fargo that was Wachovia. Um, we're gonna have the mayor come down and be part of the thing. We're gonna have the, the regional president for Wells Fargo to be part of the, of the whole deal. They had this whole thing planned. And this is being discussed in a meeting where I'm at. And um, at the time I was reporting to a guy who was two down from the CEO. And um, I was just part of the uh, and part of the marketing effort, providing data and analysis. And when I heard this, I like went ghost white. I was like, no, this is bad. I was like, no, no, wait. And so as I heard them talk about their their plan, I was like, um, I gotta say something. So I'm sitting in this room of, of mostly executives, and and I'm just an analyst, but I, I raise my hand, and I say, um, are you, are we sure we want to launch in Miami? Because um, it's not the best market for our product. 
And everyone's looking at me like, what are you talking about? So knowing the data, being a data nerd that I am, um, having studied things like census data and demographic data and understanding remittance flow is probably better than any, most people on the planet. Um, I just knew based on the data I had studied that Miami was the wrong place to launch for two reasons. One, Wells Fargo was a West Coast centric bank. I mentioned before that we started in California and it's over the years expanded eastward. All of our marketing materials are designed for um, Central Americans and uh, Mexicans. Um, they all speak in that type of Spanish. And anyone who knows Spanish and knows that you're from different parts of the world, you speak different types of Spanish, right? You know, a lot of the words are the same, but they're used differently, different influences, different words for the same thing. Um, in Miami, most of the people that speak Spanish in Miami are from Cuba or from uh, other countries like Dominican Republic um, or Venezuela or Colombia, not part of Central America, not Mexico. So my big concern was really driven primarily because I knew that our target market for senior remittances in this area is not the same one we used before. So that made me think about, okay, so maybe we're gonna have this problem because all our market material is in a Spanish that's kind of geared towards uh, Mexicans and Central Americans. So I said that. And I also said that we may wanna, may have trouble in Miami because there's so many other remittance options there. If you go to a street in Little Havana or any other parts of Miami, there are predominantly um, people that speak Spanish, you see dozens of little mom and pop money transfer stores and other places that send money. Banks aren't the primary place people go to send money. So I had these things in my mind. I said it, everyone looks at me like, okay, yeah, so um, we're locked in, we're going to Miami, we can't change it. And then at the end of the meeting, I'm just sitting there going, okay, well, you know, I tried. Um, my boss comes to me and he says, you know, you know what, Dan, um, great point, but you gotta come up with some data to back it up. You can't just say, this is what we can't do. You gotta say what we gotta do. You need a solution, right? Of course, you know, I, I need to come back with a solution. So he says, you got a couple of days, dig into your data, find out what you can find out, give me an option and I'll take it back to the executives. So I dropped what I was doing, dove into the data and started trying to figure out, so if we don't launch in Miami, I need to really explain why. But more importantly, I gotta tell people where we're gonna launch. Where are we gonna do this from? So I, I did some data analysis. I, I dug into some census data, put it through a couple of different tools we were using. Um, and I came out and found that there were other pockets in Florida um, that had really good populations for us. So long story short, I'm almost done with this storytelling. Um, the areas of opportunity were actually other parts of Florida, not in the South. Um, if you look at the, the demographics of say like Tampa, um, there are a lot of people in the Tampa area that come from Guatemala and El Salvador, two countries in Central America, which we've had a long history of sending money to. In Orlando, um, you also have a lot of Central Americans. You also have a lot of Indians. We also send money to India. And then in Jacksonville, there's a lot of Filipinos in Jacksonville and Orlando and we send money to the Philippines. So there's all these other opportunities if we're in the Northern part of the state that aren't there in the Southern part of the state. And they're all people we've all done business with for years. They're not a new population we're trying to explore. So I put all this together into a presentation. I go and tell my boss and he says, okay, let's go talk to the boss. So that means we're going to talk to the CEO. So I have to go and talk to the CEO, go into corporate headquarters, have all my data ready, have my, my charts and maps and data points and ready to try to sell him on the idea of like, you know what, we shouldn't launch in Miami, we should launch in Orlando and this is why. So I got in the room, I got my presentation ready. I was doing a PowerPoint just like this and about eight minutes in, he said, okay, I got it, we'll switch. I didn't even have to finish it. My data was so convincing and I was so passionate about it that he like, okay, it makes sense to me, we'll make the switch. That's when I realized I had just done data storytelling. It was a very, very enlightening moment for me because I realized that when you have the right data and you find the right way to share it and you have designed for the right audience, you can influence decisions. And it's a very, very powerful thing. So from that day on, I've always thought about, you know, whenever I do data analysis, Whenever I'm looking at measurements and trying to do evaluations and trying to do things that are going to um, impact decisions, I have a role to play in that. And the way that I can help figure out how to give people the right data is what drives me, right? So when you talk about data-driven decisions, this is what it is, right? So anyway, that's my data storytelling example. Any questions so far, any feedback? Um, the one question was, do you have to know your data before you take the steps from the previous slide? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, you, 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 can, you can talk about your data. You can explain what you see in the data. But if you really don't understand the data, I don't think personally that you can effectively be a data storyteller. Um, you have to know your data inside and out. Um, I guess it'd be the same thing as like, you know, when you, when you write an epic novel versus you write a, you know, dime store romance novel, one of them's deep and rich and full of like three dimensional characters. And one of them's like two dimensional characters. And one's like 600 pages and one's like 90 pages. That's the difference between somebody who knows their data and someone who, who doesn't. That's how I would kind of make that analogy. So to kind of recap, here's the key elements of data storytelling based on my example. I knew who my audience was. My audience was bank executives. I had to come at them with really polished stuff. It had to be right. It had to be short and quick to the point, and it had to be influential. I knew how much time I had. I had less than a week put it together, right? So I had to crunch some things. I had to really make sure that I was able to get the right data points. I knew my tools, right? So I used IBM Cognos to structure the data. Um, I used customer data, demographic data, competitor data. Um, I did a couple of different types of analysis on this. Um, and then the key insight though was missed opportunity. If we didn't go to Orlando, we would miss an opportunity. Um, we would probably have a less than exciting launch, maybe even a failure. And if we went to Orlando, it'd be a much easier sell. Um, my visualization of choice was using Tableau to, because of maps. Tableau is a great tool for maps and I, maps work. Um, they're very powerful tools, at least my experience. So showing someone you know, how things can change based on just coding uh, regional areas based on demographic population is, is something that people can look at and make sense of. The big take of it was worth lots of money. The, the bank would make a lot more money based on my analysis and, and the, if we went to Orlando, a lot more money, a lot quicker um, and a lot more secure. And the bullet points that I use, new business, unexpected profits, easy delivery, right? So the idea is that I wanted the executives to know this is what they're gonna get if they go with my recommendation. And it wasn't me recommending it, it was the data. I was just the messenger. And although I did obviously put my own two cents into it, it was the data that told me to raise my hand and say, I think we might be going the wrong way. That's an example of data storytelling. Now, we probably all have examples of when we use data to be able to move a decision. Um, we see it every day. Another great example um, is, is baseball. How many of you, drop a one in the comments, if you're familiar with either the book or the movie Moneyball. Um, the book or the movie Moneyball both talk about how uh, analytics, data analysis revolutionized baseball. Um, by looking at stats to figure out which were the best players. No longer are people being measured on how far they hit a home run or how fast they run or how, how necessarily how fast they pitch, but how much they get on base and how good they are at, at getting people on base. That was the whole justification of um, moving from a traditional scouting based on what you see to a computer-based uh, technology-based scouting that they do now. And baseball evolved quite a bit since the early 2000s. And if you look at the teams that won the World Series in the years after um, Moneyball came out and that became more common, a lot of them followed that Moneyball structure. And even today, you're starting to see if you're a baseball fan now, there's all this stories about how baseball is uh, evolved to a point where it's all about home runs, right? There's no more like hitting the ball to the opposite field. There's no more like hit and run. There's hardly any more steals. It's like the Data tells us if we can hit three or four home runs a game, we're going to win 100, game, 100 games in a year. And that's the structure, the strategy now. It's all based on data, right? So um, a great example of data storytelling is Moneyball, especially the movie. There's some scenes in that movie where uh, Jonah Hill and Brad Pitt have conversations that are very powerful examples of how uh, you can use data to drive decision making. So... That's just a, a quick key elements of data storytelling. Anybody have any questions about these elements? Anybody want to give any feedback? Okay, so I'm going to go through real quick and talk about some of the, the, the things that you use, some of the methodologies, right? So when I hear, when, when Bev mentioned these things to me, like um, parametric and non-parametric equations, I'm like, oh man, physical analysis. I got I to gotta go back and look at stuff. So I actually went to Khan Academy, which I love, to get a refresher on just exactly what are parametric and non-parametric equations because um, they're not the kind of thing that data scientists 
would use if they're in the data storytelling aspect. These are more data engineering, data science kind of things where um, you want to figure out exactly why things are happening, how things are happening. There was a great analogy that the Khan Academy had about um, trying to figure out, you know, what would be the rate of descent of a car going off a cliff. And all the everything you see on here is all the variables, right? The cliff is, you know, 50 meters high and the car was going five meters a second. And at what point would it hit the ground? How much time would pass? So like the variable was T, was time. Um, so I thought about from a policy perspective, what if your goal is simply to be able to, um, you have people that are going off a cliff, so you wanna put up a warning sign, right? So the idea is that we're to put a warning sign on the edge of a cliff so people don't drive over it. Um, you, would not, you would just need to know how far back the sign should be to prevent people from going off the cliff. Right, so it'd be a simple equation to figure that out. Um, that's where data science, that's where what we do comes into play, why we do statistical analysis, because it helps us figure out how to um, tell a policymaker or inform a decision maker where to put the sign. Make sense? So pretty simple stuff. Um, this thing, you know, I'm gonna just talk about it for a minute. And obviously this is stuff you guys spend a lot more time working on, but when it comes to using parametric and non-parametric equations, um, we never talk about that outside of ourselves, right? Um, if you go into a meeting and you're with a decision maker or a policy maker or somebody who's going to uh, take action based on your analysis and they ask you what parametric and non-parametric equations you use to make up this analysis, that's a pretty rare thing. <laughs> that does not happen very often. Um, so anyway, um, the other thing is that sort of non-parametric, trying to figure out you know, um, exactly when you build a model that doesn't have all the de defined definitions you want, um, that has things that aren't easy to fit into uh, buckets or categories, like how many accidents will a warning sign prevent? See, like trying to talk about where to put a stop sign, everything is pretty set, right? It's a matter of figuring out physically where the stop sign goes based on that data. But with, a, with trying to figure out where, or how many accidents you might prevent by having a warning sign, there's a lot more unknowns in there. So there's a couple examples of where if you're trying to uh, again, figure out how to explain where to put a stop sign. Why are you trying to do that? What is the reason for it? And then what data would you apply to answer that question? So when you're looking at ways to really to use non-parametric equations, they really come from my perspective, my experience, more in trying to figure out kind of like what ifs. Um, and when you're doing statistical analysis, um, again, I could you know speak of this all night and we would you know probably, um, I'll have fun with it, but um, just what I'm thinking about, I think about really how do you tell a story around it? What are you trying to influence with it? What is your end goal? Um, are you trying to tell someone where to put a sign? Or are you trying to somebody, tell, tell somebody that if we don't put a sign, we're gonna have X, many, X number of accidents? So um, another thing that, that came up was descriptive inf inferential statistics, right? Um, I, I found this visual. Um, hey, Dan, can I interrupt you for a second to go back to the, the parametric and the non-parametric equations. Our instructors for SPEC 660 are, um, they're, are they, you don't know what that is, data-driven decision-making. Mm -hmm. um, they are on the call tonight as well. I wonder if they had any comments please. Yes, please. on these in relation to the work that the students are doing in that class. Thanks, Bev. Hey, Dan. Nice to see you hey. again. Yes, good to see you again. <laughs> Um, quick question. So in this course that I'm actually teaching, um, so we have some data sets, for instance, they are uh, FIFA data sets, they are medical appointment, missed appointment data sets. So these are kind of extant data that are already mm -hmm. there. Uh, usually we know that in the research process, the data are collected after you develop the research questions, but you know, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the items that my students generally kind of feel stuck is like we uh, we have this data, we are going over those data sets, and we are supposed to come up with some questions. And once we have those questions, what kind of data analysis are we supposed to run? Um, so if the questions are more kind of looking at relationship between one item and the other, then, you know, maybe correlation. What if there is really no story going on, but I just want to know what is the kind of lay of the land? So just descriptives and run some basic histograms or bar graphs. So, um, so I was wondering if you may have some guidance when you have a data set already given to you, 
you are developing some questions. You're also doing some literature review uh, based on that topic. And then you're exploring the data and doing some basic analysis. So what, what kind of analysis do you think the students might actually uh, be able to do? Well, I think, first of all, you know, data storytelling, I think, is when you have um, a lot of questions already out there. So the exploratory analysis you're talking about is more trying to just figure out what it's, what's here, right? So you're looking at the data, trying to discover, and you're in a discovery period. And sometimes you will discover things that you can immediately start thinking, I got to tell people about this. I got to show people this. I got to explain this. And that's where you might want to start using data storytelling. But just in general, I mean, there's, without seeing the data, I, I'd, I'd be hard pressed to like say, okay, we should do this or this or this. But I, I think in general, you, the first question you want to ask yourself, is like, is this data for me to understand more data? Is this gonna be, am I the one asking the questions or am I answering questions for somebody else? And, and, and that will really guide you on which way you wanna go because if you're answering questions for yourself, then you want to like keep peeling back the onion until you get to really what, you're, what makes you go, okay, cool, I found something that's worth telling. But if you're doing it for somebody else, usually the time constraint, usually it's like, I need this, you know, by the end of the week, I need this X, Y, Z. Um, so you don't have as much time to do as much analysis. So that's why we, we tend to fall in on the next slide. I have descriptive and inferential. We tend to, to follow most of the time on descriptive analytics and descriptive analysis. Um, we talk about what happened. And then sometimes we're able to actually do, you know, predictive analysis or, or do some kind of modeling to show what might happen. Um, but when it comes to, to trying to figure out what to do with the data set you have, Really, it's a matter of, of who's the consumer of the analysis and what do they need and how quickly do they need it. So that's what the, the parts of data storytelling that um, always ring true, whatever you're do, whether you're doing storytelling or not, is who's going to consume the results of my analysis. Okay. One other short question, if I may, is that sure. one of the um, assignments which I feel that the students um, feel challenged is, you know, after looking at the data is to... Um, develop a pivot table um, mm -hmm. and that's where it's like you know we've all learned sometimes you know we have learned through YouTube videos even if we have PhDs in you know research methodology but you know who does this every day right we don't right, exactly and we forget mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes you need everybody needs a refresher course like you went to Khan Academy exactly. and, and, and sometimes I just go to you know YouTube videos and just check them out right so pivot table is something I've insisted upon that you know everybody should know because these are summary Absolutely. tables is a contingency table and that will give you a lot of story yeah. and don't run into making these fancy graphs before you actually understand what exactly are the data telling you don't exactly. worry about the colorful graphs so i was wondering if you could just kind of throw some light on that yes i will i'll get into visualization in a minute but just to the pivot table piece um you know one of the things i found out at wells fargo so I, just real quick my background is actually in education. Um, I was actually teaching before I went to work for Wells Fargo. Long story short, the school I was working at closed. I had to find a job, worked for Wells Fargo. Um, but when I was at Wells Fargo, I found out I had a skill set that most of my peers did not have. I could use Excel, right? And not only could I use Excel, but I knew how to do pivot tables. And that led to you know, where I'm at now. If I wouldn't have known how to do pivot tables back in the mid-90s, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. It's kind of funny. So pivot tables are the cornerstone of every type of analysis. So if you can't master a pivot table, um, then you're probably gonna have trouble down the road trying to build models. Um, any kind of a predictive model you do, any kind of even models that you're trying to explain in descriptive behavior, um, pivot tables are the best, quickest way to do it. So I, I agree with you 100%. You know, if, if there's a tool in your tool belt that you need, the pivot table is your hammer. You bring it out you know, more often than any other tool. So. Um, and then beyond understanding pivot tables, really, before you get too caught up in, in making great analysis, again, you have to think about who's going to use this analysis. Um, you don't need to you know, spend hours and hours and hours building models, trying to explain why it happened, what happened. If somebody just cares about one number you know, at the end of the day, how many you know, um, people will be, inf be impacted if we move this river? Um, or we put up a dam, or we uh, move our vaccination site, or whatever it may be, sometimes they just want that simple answer. And they really don't need all the details and all the understanding and all the depth. So that's why I talk a lot about knowing your audience, because we can, as data nerds, get stuck in the data and lose focus of the fact that we're trying to do something generally 
to help somebody else make a decision. So anyway, um, that was a great question. Any other questions or any other thoughts from the faculty? I don't know if asthma is still on here, or Professor Ali is still on here or not. I can look and see on the list. Um, um, well, one of the things that, that I would say is oftentimes students will look at, at data and everything tends to be, you go to your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of students, the comfort zone is that descriptive mm -hmm. statistics. Yep. Um, how do you as an analyst know when you need to take this a step up to do something more than just descriptive? Well, I, I think it's, it's the, if there's immediate need, if there's an urgency on people that need to know what's going to happen, that's where you really need to kind of like change your, your approach. Um, you can look at, at historical data and do descriptive analysis and get all kinds of great stuff. But a lot of times it doesn't tell us where we're going. Um, like for example, last night, um, if you were watching the uh, NBA game, the Warriors and the uh, Lakers, um, if you ever follow any sports games, there's an app on ESPN that shows like the uh, um, likelihood of winning for that team. And the Warriors were winning most of the game. So they were over 50% chance of winning. The Lakers though won at the end, they came on strong at the end and they won the game. And at the end of the game, their percentage of winning was 100%. But throughout that you know, 48 minutes of games, most of the time the Warriors were favored. So the whole point there is that when you are trying to predict something, um, you can't just look at historical data. You have to constantly refresh it and constantly build more and feed more and more in your models. Descriptive necessarily, you don't have to do that. You can look at a period in time and you can always add more to it, but you're probably gonna get most likely patterns that are gonna be slowly evolving. But when you look at predictions, you can actually see really quick changes. So you wanna build predictive models. You wanna do more um, looking at smaller groups like inferential statistics. You know, you wanna be able to make quicker, more you know, rapid uh, decisions. That's when you would do more than just look at descriptive data. So hope that helps. I'm gonna move on just so we don't go too long. Visualization. So they say a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, I think a good pie chart is worth a thousand rows of Excel data. It's one of my sayings. And when you wanna think about how to visualize data, to be able to take something very simple and make it very powerful. If you've never heard of Hans Rosling, he was a data scientist, he passed away a few years ago, but he was amazing. And if you just Google or YouTube Hans Rosling, you'll see how he would take very simple data sets and visualize them doing basically just like we see in front of you, just some, some pies on a, on a chart and doing some, some basic bubble analysis. Um, it's, it's amazing how he does it, but it's a combination of not just the data, but how he tells the story. And so when you wanna tell a data story, you gotta find the right visual. It's gotta be something your audience can understand. Visualization is very, very challenging because a lot of us tend to go with what we know. We know how to do pie charts. We know how to do line graphs. We know how to do bar charts. They're simple, they're intuitive, we make them. But then when we find out that they're not the best ones for our data, what else do we do? So I would encourage anybody out there who uses Excel on a regular basis to explore the other 40, 50 different types of data visualizations that's in Excel. So you don't just rely on the, on the common ones. And obviously Dr. Rosling was a great example of how he took one that, um, and made it very powerful. So check him out if you get a chance. Um, the other thing about visualization is you have to remember that you're gonna show people stuff for the first time. When you visualize something, you know what it says already. You make a pie chart, you know what the pie chart tells you. But you, if it's a stranger who walks into a room and doesn't know you, doesn't know your data, if they look at that pie chart, can they make sense of it? So you wanna ask yourself, are you really designing the pie chart for you or for your audience? And so when you think of visualization, you really wanna figure out, again, it goes back to who's your audience, what's their level of understanding, how much knowledge do they have of the data? Do they need time to, to absorb it or are they gonna get it when they first see it? That will help you pick out which visualization to use. Um, we also talked about, I mean, you mentioned Bev about testing correlations. Um, again, this is where visualization comes in powerful, right? You no, know, so visualization of data. Um, these are two examples which um, are pretty clear, pretty straightforward. So looking at, you know, treatment um, for blood pressure before and after and, you know, correlation between uh, age and men having hair on their head. Um, simple things like this, when you put it in front of an audience, you wanna make sure the audience can go, mm, okay, got it, move on, right? 
you don't want the audience to get lost. Because here's a, a tip for doing a presentation and doing storytelling with, with visualizations, is that if your, your audience gets stuck on a visual and they can't figure it out, they will block out everything you say. They will spend who knows how much time trying to figure out what the heck you meant with that visualization. And you don't want that to happen. So a lot of time when you're doing things like you're showing data from more um, advanced and anal more advanced analysis, or you're doing things like where you're showing uh, data based on really detailed statistical analysis, you want to make sure you have simple visuals. In fact, there's a, a, a rule I would say that the more complicated the answer, the simpler your visual should be. So when I think about visualization, I think a lot about that. What is the best visual? Should I use a pie chart? Should I use a you know a, a x y axis? Should I show something that's got a you know different uh, visualization? I'll talk about a few more in a minute, but that's where a lot of people lose the ability to tell stories with data is that they lose their audience in the visual. So for me, the best data tool is, is Tableau. I know some of you are, use Tableau. Um, a Tableau is the most uh, widely used business intelligence, business dashboarding visualization tool. They also have a data storytelling component where you can storyboard stuff. Um, whatever tool you use though, um, you wanna really understand the different powers that that tool has. If you're using Power BI or if you're using like ClickView or any of the other dozens out there, um, they all have their pros and cons, but the bottom line is, is that visuals are what is going to tell your story. Um, you can tell a story and your words can tell a story, but people learn visually and most of them are going to remember what they saw, not what they heard. Most of them are going to walk out with those two or three takeaways because you showed them something that stuck in their head. As a reminder, for me, the linchpin of my entire data storytelling exercise with the, with the executives at Wells Fargo was the map was to show them like, hey, we could do this one pocket down here where we cover like part of the state or we could do this other thing and, and get multiple parts of the state with one fell swoop. And that was like the game changer for them because they're like, oh yeah, wow, we should definitely do Orlando instead of doing Miami because there's so much more opportunity. So um, visualization. This is another example real quick I'll show it. I know I'm running a little short on time so I'll kind of wrap it up. Um, I have a call center business in the Philippines as well. And so we were having trouble with attrition, people dropping off the face of the, of the earth and not showing up for work. And so we did some simple analysis in Tableau plotting you know, where people lived. And um, we looked at this and we're like, well, it doesn't really tell us anything. The red dots are people that you know, um, attrited, the green dots are people that were still with us and the, and the um, yellow dots were the ones that uh, left um, but weren't terminated. So there's this, like, a, a random pattern around Manila, around my office of where attrition was. But when we overlaid this with commute times, um, we found that some people had much easier commutes even though it lived much farther away. And then so we understood the attrition was being caused more so by the difficulty of commute than anything else. So another way to, to use visualizations, maps, I love Tableau, I'll move off topic and come back to it. A couple more things I wanna talk about real quick and then we'll wrap up. The first most important use for data storytelling is to enable the audience. Um, you want the audience to be able to look at data and make decisions. This is the enable part, right? You're just giving them stuff. You're saying, here's my data. Here's the visualization of it. Here's the story. Boom. Go do something with it. One of the best resources, if you've never heard of Cole Naflick, um, she is freaking amazing. Google her. Check out her book. She just launched a new book. She's a friend of mine. She is, the, without a doubt, the best uh, data speaker, public speaker out there today talking on a regular basis. She comes to school, she goes to corporations, she does public trainings. Um, Cole is amazing. Um, she's got a book, it's all about the, this is how you do visuals. And data storytelling at its core is really powerful visuals. Just like Star Wars is a movie that's primarily about the visuals. It's got, you know, great characters and everyone loves, you know, different things about it, but people walk away talking about, can you believe those effects? This is the kind of thing you want for your data storytelling. Cole will show you how to have the effects to make your story stand out. The next one I'll talk about is empowering data storytelling, right? So Stephen Fuse kind of like the grandfather of business dashboards. Um, he wrote a book back in the mid 2000s um, that was revolutionary. So if you haven't ever read Stephen Fuse, check out his stuff. Um, he said, numbers are an important story to tell. They rely on you give a convincing voice, right? So this is something that when I heard this, when I first read this, it stuck with me for the rest of, of the time I've been doing data. Numbers have an important story to tell. You're the storyteller, you're empowering. So you're not just enabling, giving people things they can make a decision on. You're also putting a narrative around it that's convincing because you want people to listen. 
you, this is why I say you have to have some knowledge of your data to really be good at data storytelling, because you have to have a convincing story. You have to back it up with like, well, the data really tells me this. And I know the data because I've looked at this data and looked at this data. So the more familiarity you have with your data, no, no, the better you will be and empowering. This is the max. Okay, so oh. the last part that I'll talk about is Mike. Mike. Yeah. Oh, okay, there. Hold on. Yeah, okay. it's fine. I just um, I There's muted somebody. someone that uh, okay. didn't realize they were not muted. Okay. So the last thing we'll talk about is the influence, right? So enable is about just sharing information and letting people like make decisions off it. Empowering is like kind of like getting them to do something with the data. And then you have influence. And I put this up here. Um, I don't want to get political with anybody, but my point is, is that there was a lot of talk and a lot of discussion about after the 2016 election um, about how much data science and how much analytics and how much um, was put into uh, both campaigns. And the fact that, that uh, Cambridge Analytica um, had such a big scandal about what they were doing. And, and for those of you that aren't familiar, you know, it's worth checking out. There's a, a great documentary on, on uh, Netflix and you can Google it or YouTube it. But basically the idea is that, you know, if you have data, you can do some things with it that aren't necessarily always noble or good. I mean, the, the information that was used in presidential elections the last couple of times and will only be used more so, um, knowing exactly what Facebook ad to put in front of what person based on their demographics and their usage patterns, to be able to influence their vote this is new things for us. We're, we're still trying to figure out how to deal with this kind of stuff, right? But this is where we're at. If you have the right data and you're able to, to build around it a story, you can really influence decision-making. You can, and, and again, as an example, you can show a bunch of people that are from a certain ethnic group, a certain stereotypical thing that makes them not want to vote and do it in large scale numbers. That's incredible power. And you see that all around us. You see that, you know, in, in how we shop and how we do things. It both amazes me and creeps me out that I can go online and Google like, you know, vacation in Bahamas and look at a couple of vacation spots. I don't buy anything. I don't log into anything. I just look at a couple of different vacations, locations. Five minutes later on my Facebook newsfeed, up pops the same thing I was just looking at. And not just any random Bahama vacation, but a Bahama vacation designed for someone like me. They know that I like to be at the beach. They know that I like to have good meals. They know that I'm single. They know that I, I don't have any young children. So they design a package based for just me. Now, if I was like, you know, younger and married and had young kids, I would have got a different ad. That's power, right? We all know that. So when you think about what you're doing, when you're helping decision makers, when you're, you're doing your evaluation and you're doing your analysis and you're sharing information, um, there's influence to it. So I always think of myself as trying to be a bit of the guardian of the data. And the last thing I'll end on is an example um, of where this went south. So I used to have a lot of pride that I worked for Wells Fargo because it was a really cool place to work for a long time. But they went south um, with their... Uh, choices about um, compensating bankers for opening up accounts that people didn't know they opened up. And they got busted for that. And they still are kind of like in you know purgatory with the Senate about that. But I saw that. I had the data when I was at Wells Fargo and it told me there are bankers opening up expressing agreements that there's no activity there. Why they open it? They're opening up to get the credit, the sale, the, the money. Um, I reported that and no one ever did it. So it's an example of how, even though you have the data, you can't always influence things. So you wanna figure out when you do have an opportunity to use your data to not just enable, not just empower, but to influence, that you do it in ways that are to your core and for the common good. That's just my two cents, hope it helps. Um, that's my talk for today. If you're interested in learning more about me, I have a YouTube channel, feel free to check it out. Um, I have dozens of videos about many things, but there's a whole section on, analytics and my experience having trained analysts and topics that I talk about. Um, so thank you for your time. Now go out there and tell your data story. Thanks very much, Dan. I appreciate your experiences and your, uh, your stories that you told us. Um, Kavita popped in and said that she has a decision tree that she likes to share which tells which analysis to use 
if, when, and if. Maybe, could you talk a little bit about that, Kavita? Yeah, sure. So um, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, you should be able to. Okay, let me, yeah, give me one second. Okay, so this is just a heads up for my 640 or 6, 660 students that this is coming up. Um, especially in terms of, you know, the kind of data that you may have, um, the if and then kind of question, what kind of analysis you're going to do, uh, depending on the nominal kind of data or ordinal kind of data, uh, if you're trying to find a pre and post differences, this is the kind of decision tree I use this to this day, because sometimes we deal with uh, very big data and sometimes we deal with small data and then you often ask question, well, if I have this kind of data, what kind of analysis might be um, appropriate. So I'm going to share this. Um, I'm going to share a few links in the chat box. Uh, use what you think is appropriate. Some of them are complicated. Some of them are not that complicated. But just kind of keep this as a cheat sheet. And uh, you know, for my uh, for my class, I'm going to share this anyway, probably next week when we go into week three and week four data analysis. But for the good of the group, I'm happy to share a few links as well. Awesome. Yeah, see, this is exactly the my, one of my points that I make is that to really do great data storytelling, you need to know what to do to pull your right data. Mm -hmm. But no one else but you really cares. Um, so you have to be amazing at this. You have to own it and know your data and know what to do. But at the same time, you have to be able to turn around and tell a story. Um, it's really, really challenging to be a data storyteller because you have to be equally good at the nerd side and the people side. And this is why it's such an in-demand skill it's really hard to find people who can do this kind of analysis um, and then turn around and convince a bunch of the executives in three sentences or less why they should make a big change in their decision making. Exactly, because they, you know, the, the executives or even clients for that matter as a practicing evaluator, they, they really don't care what I did. Did I do, did I do um, ANOVA? Did I do, uh, you know, very sophisticated ANCOVA? I mean, who cares? They're like, tell us the story. Is our program working? Mm -hmm. uh, what do exactly. we need to do to make changes? Who is performing well? What's the story behind them? And if you are doing a mixed methods, which I highly encourage all of you to do, is you know you are triangulating the data using um, interviews, focus groups, observations. So you tell the whole story in a much more holistic fashion. Absolutely. Yep. See, I, I look at this and I go, that's, that's art. That's like, that's <laughs> like beautiful to see this, right? But then we're nerds like that. So <laughs> cool. Thank you for sharing that. Did anybody have any of the final questions or anything? I mean, it was fun. Let me just pipe in that we did a workshop a few months ago on evaluation report writing um, with three evaluators from the US Department of State. And well, one of the first thing they said was take out the math. We do not wanna see the math. We don't wanna read the math. Have a section in an appendix where you talk about math for people that wanna look at the math, but most of us don't. <laughs> yep. um, we just want that story and it's it's interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Do we have any other questions? You, um, can you just give us, uh, for students that are interested in, in data visualization beyond a, a pie chart, what do you recommend that they do? So, I mentioned it before, and I can't say it enough. Um, follow Cole. Go look up Cole Nafflick. Um, and she's like, to me, the, one of the best practitioners of data visualization right now. Um, look up Hans Reisling. Google him. His stuff, you know, he passed away a few years ago, but his stuff is amazing. When you look at people like that, and you see that they have this talent for almost entertaining, but at the same time, educating, enabling, empowering, um, that's how you want to be. So when you want to think about data storytelling, even if you're not the most gifted storyteller, um, if you have the right data, you put it in the right visuals, you deliver it the right way, you're gonna be able to influence decision-making. So um, I, I think the best thing to do though is also is if you use Tableau, keep using Tableau, but if you don't use Tableau, whatever you're using, practice visualization, right? Practice, 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 and share it, get eyes on it. One of the cool things about Tableau, why I, I love them so much, is they have a really big user group where they have like visits of the month contests where people can submit their visualizations and then people can vote to decide which was the best one. It's a great place to see different ideas, um, different perspectives, and it really helps you kind of get outside your own box when it comes to visuals. 
Because I think that's where 90% of people that make visualizations, they fail um, to some extent. There's somebody in the room that's not getting it. There's somebody in the room that walks out going like, you know, I didn't understand that pie chart. Um, to really nail it every time, you have to really, really, really focus on understanding your audience and finding the right visual for them. And that's the key of, of data storytelling. And I love the decision tree. I actually took a screenshot of it. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, and the 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 they're on the in the chat as well. If you can pull up the chat, I'll leave this open for a couple of minutes for people that want to to pull up and and bookmark those pages. I'm going to ask you one a uh, very you know um, customer oriented question, Dan, because you know you and I we both deal with clients or customers. Um, Give us two examples, one where there was an aha moment and you were like, great, you know, that's why I do what I do. Mm -hmm. And the second is like, oh my God, I spend so much time and they just don't get it. Right. <laughs> so there's a, uh, there's a coffee chain, Coffee Bean. They're kind of like a, a competitor of Starbucks or California based, but they have a lot of uh, branches in the Philippines. And a, a couple of business analysts working for Coffee Bean in the Philippines came to me and asked for help because their boss was telling them, hey, some of our, our locations aren't selling enough coffee and we've got to fire people if we can't figure out how to get things right. And I'm like, well, let's look at the data. So I look at their data sets and all their data sets are based on point of sale transactions. And they're, they're seeing which stores are selling the most coffee. And that's all they're looking at. They're not looking at anything else. So I say, well, what about like location? or size of the, of the stock room or all these other things that could like, so they walked away with all these ahas and they went back and they figured out really what was causing certain stores to have lower coffee sales. And in the end, it was the fact that they had smaller storerooms and they couldn't physically carry as much coffee in that location. So they were ready to fire some store managers for poor sales when it was not the store manager's fault. So that was an aha moment. And the data, you had to go outside your data set, right? You had to find additional data to triangulate, as you said, you know, what you're seeing. Um, one of the moments where I just like go like this is uh, I, I worked with a, a company that um, is, has an online auction site. They're kind of like an eBay for, au for auction houses. And um, we were sitting there talking about how they should be able to, without a lot of effort, figure out what auction houses are making them the most money. Um, it's a simple, you know, like gathering data and doing some reporting. Um, and then analyzing it to figure out, you know, based on the auction house, how much it should sell, what they should make off it, a couple of different, you know, slices of data. And I spent like a couple hours with their management team trying to explain this. And um, they kept coming back to like, well, we have this in Excel. We have this report in Excel. Um, that's all they wanted. They didn't want to have any data models. They didn't want me to build anything for them. They wanted a simple Excel report. And so it was like, oh. You know, I spent all this time talking to them about building data models and all they wanted was an Excel report, but they didn't say that up front, right? So anyway, that's how it's like in the real world, right? You get people that either you can wow them or they wow you, one of the two. Exactly. And one thing I've learned in my practice is, you know, keep the technical stuff to yourself or to mm -hmm. the appendix. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, it, it's not a show and tell story. It's just telling story, which is useful. They are your clients and you are really servicing a client. So exactly. tell them what they need to hear. And there will be some very sophisticated clients. And some of them will say, just tell me, as you said, three bullet points, what's working, what's not working, what I need to, what I need to do. And yep. another thing is, you know, it's good to have Tableau. It's, it's, it's good to also have access to SPSS, SAS, yes. R, yes. and whatnot. But also don't forget your humble Excel. And also don't forget your Google Sheets. Yep. Google Sheet has some very sophisticated coding already in it, all you have to do is click that explore button or run a pivot table and it will do it for you. Um, I think, yeah, I think that may be a challenge and not to put a, a generational thing on it, but if you grew up using Excel yeah. mostly, and that was your primary tool for most of your professional career, like it was for mine, um, you go to Excel first and, and you, you keep it simple and you only add on complication when you have right. to. Right. I think a lot of people, and, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, is that you get so caught up in wanting to build these models and do all these kind of cool, you know, AI driven, you know, uh, decision trees and all this kind of stuff you can build um, that you forget how to do the basics. Exactly. It's almost like, you know, um, you have a car that you can't fix exactly. because it's too complicated. 
And oh, when something yeah. breaks, yeah. when something breaks, it's done, right? When you have a coding error in a, a model that you spent a week working on, and there's one line of code somewhere in that model that's not working. Exactly. You should have done it in Excel. You could have exactly. done the same thing in Excel. <laughs> or, or you're just spending so much time, you know, making beautiful colors. I'm like, who cares? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Color. Visual, that's a whole other topic. Visualization. Like, to me, this is like the biggest problem I have with people with my visuals is they get caught up in colors, right? So there is nothing better scientifically proven, historically accurate, white background, black text, yeah. right? Anything else beyond that, the human eye has trouble with. Yeah. So the more colors you put on a, a screen, the more colors in a pie chart, the more colors in a line graph, the more different types of fonts you use, the more things you make people's yeah. eyes work to understand things, yeah. the less power you're gonna have as a, as a storyteller. True, true. Beautiful, thank you, thank you so much. Super, my pleasure, I had a lot of fun, as always, so. Yep. Thanks very much. Any other final questions or comments from anybody? Everyone's just writing in the chat that they learned a lot. It was a great presentation. My um, pleasure. Yeah, that um, liked your presentation style. So thank you very much, Dan, for joining us and for teaching our workshop this evening. I think we all learned a lot from you. Thanks as well, Kavita, for talking about your work and for relating this to um, the, the data-driven decision-making class. And um, yeah, really appreciate all the time that everyone spent with us tonight. Um, we will, I'm in the process of arranging our June workshop and we'll uh, send the information about that as soon as we have it finalized. So thank you very much, Dan, for spending the time with us. Really appreciate everything that you've, you've told us today. Happy to be here. Thank Look you. Look forward to doing it again someday. Take care. Take care.